Greetings, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to another episode of Corpse Club Horror BFFs. I'm one of your Horror BFFs, Patrick Bromley, joined, as always, by my Horror BFF, Heather Wixen. Hi, Heather. Hello. What are we talking about on this episode of Corpse Club Horror BFFs? Oh, you're going to put it on me? Oh, yeah. gosh, I just thought I was going to coast. <laughs> uh, so this week, because we are in the midst of doing our Class of 1981 coverage, uh, celebration, hoopla, if you will. Um, I think the world needs a little more hoopla. I'm all um, about the we hoopla. Are, we are all about the hoopla. That's I'm knee t-shirt. deep in the hoopla. Ooh, that's even better. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, a movie that by a director that I know you love, mm-hmm. and it's a movie I've never seen. So this was super fun for me, and we're going to be chatting about Blowout today. Yes, Blowout celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> what is going on with time? It just keeps passing. It, it really, really does. Yeah. I know. I, I remember thinking back when I turned 40 and I was like, OK, so all these movies that came out my birthday year, I was like, oh, that's interesting. But now all these movies that like we're getting into movies that like, I grew up with that are turning 40 right. and I'm not ready for that. No, these are movies that came out when you were alive and you remember and they're turning 40. Oh, geez. Yeah. As soon as the thing turns 40 next year, like that's it. That's the I'm end done. of it. Yeah, because that's, yeah, 82 is like my first really like year of consciousness as far as movies go because it's E.T. and it's Star Trek 2 and it's a lot of movies in 82 uh, that I was aware of as a kid. And yeah, they'll all turn 40 next year, which is terrific. I think it's I think it's time to put the old all of us olds out in the pasture. I think next year. <laughs> sure, that makes You're sense. Like, all right, everybody just head out there. We all get to retire. <laughs> I think so. This Good luck, great. kids. It's yeah. all on you now. Yeah. Have fun Enjoy with uh, talking about movies. Um, last year for class of 1980, we did a show on Dress to Kill, so it's I fitting know. that one year later we get to talk about another Brian De Palma masterpiece, if I may say. Blowout. Yes. Yeah, I was really excited. Like, um, first of all, it was like one of these things where I'm like, I don't own it. So I was like, shit, you know, where am I going to find this? So thankfully, uh, for anybody listening, if you haven't seen Blown Out, Blown Out, Blowout, <laughs> uh, I'm going to get this right. Sorry. If you haven't seen it, uh, Pluto is streaming it right now for free on oh, their app. Okay. So that's where we watched it. It has some annoying commercials. What are you going to do? It's free. Um, so that is how we went ahead and saw it. But I'll tell you what, because uh, my other half watched it with me last night and he's never seen it either. And this is how well it went over where as soon as it was done, we were like, how do we buy the Criterion we need it <laughs> immediately? And he started looking on eBay. I started looking on Amazon. So it quickly won us over. It is so freaking good. I love to hear it. Yes. Like, and here's the thing, like, I don't know why I'm surprised because in general, I'm a pretty big De Palma fan. Like, Mm -hmm. I haven't really seen anything from him during, like, the span of his, you know, the 70s through the 90s. I don't really haven't seen anything that I haven't ever disliked. So, like, I knew this was going to be a slam dunk, but I didn't know it was going to be like a Harlem (laughs) Globetrotter slam dunk where there's like twirling and dancing about and showgirls and then woo and then fireworks go off and everything is just amazing um yeah i freaking loved it oh that's so awesome to hear um yeah in the same way that like i think last month when we did our horror bffs we talked about the fly and i don't i think i made this point because it's something i've said a million times that like Videodrome is my favorite cronenberg the fly i think is the best cronenberg i think it's the best movie he's ever made in terms of matching his sensibility with a more commercial sensibility. Um, For me, Phantom of the Paradise, as you know, is my favorite Brian De Palma movie, but I think Blowout is his absolute best movie. I think if he's only allowed to have one movie that we call his masterpiece, I think this is it. Yeah, it's it's weird because like we were again, I was kind of like looking through uh, his filmography, which I can't even believe you know, that he was doing stuff back in the 60s because yeah. I didn't realize he went back that far, which is bananas. Um, his his very I, first movie is a movie called Murder a la, Ma, a la Maud. 
Uh, there's a little clip of it in Blowout that Dennis France is watching at one point, but that's on the Criterion disc. Oh, interesting. So that's what he was watching because I, I was yeah. trying to figure that out. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, there's so many movies I would consider his masterpiece. Like, for me, like, I just, I absolutely love Carrie. I can't even explain sure. it. Um, but I watch that a lot. Carrie gets um, better every time I watch it. You know, it kind of does, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'll talk about this, too. But, I, like, it, it makes me fall in love I, all over again with John Travolta in some weird, meat-headed way. <laughs> and then getting to see him in this, you know, with this totally different dynamic between him and Nancy Allen. Um, yeah, I'm just like, I'm like... Do you do you go with like his older something older like Fan of the Paradise or Carrie or Blowout or do you go with something like The Untouchables or of course yeah. you know there's you know generations upon generations of young men out there who've had Scarface posters <laughs> on their bedroom yeah. walls for decades now yeah. or you know do you go something with like go with like Mission Impossible or Raising Cain which is amazing like or I mean I don't know Snake Eyes I love Snake like, Eyes Jesus Christ, like, I don't know, like, what, I don't know what, what was in the water when Brian De Palma was, like, coming up as a filmmaker, but, like, just looking at the amount of movies that he has done in his career, the the variety, mm -hmm. um, and yet they all still feel like his work, like, that's pretty remarkable. And very few misses i would say and i say that as a fan of brian de palma i guess if you're not a fan there might be a movie like femme fatale that you're like eh but i watch femme fatale and i'm like no 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 this is a masterpiece this is a great movie this is about his whole filmography um his last movie the name of which i can't even remember but i reviewed Domino? it for daily dead yeah Domino. was so hugely disappointing and is like one of his few misses but i also know that I think they cut the the studio or the producers cut like an hour out of that movie. Like he's completely disowned that movie. So I can't even hold it against him for, you know, being the filmmaker who's lost it late in his career. Um, that one's not really on him, unfortunately, but that movie is not good. Yeah. I mean, like if you just look at his run from sisters, which I just finally got to see, um, because of HBO Max. So if you look at his run from 72 to Snake Eyes in 98, like there, I don't think there's a movie in there and I don't even necessarily love, love the bonfire of the vanities, but it's still fun. Um, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I remember seeing it at the drive-in, you know, Oh really? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it had Bruce Willis, we watched it. Um, that movie, um, it didn't get me kicked out of film school. It was one of the reasons that I like dropped out of film school. The real reason I dropped out of film school is because I, they wanted more money and I didn't have it. <laughs> but, ah. but the first week I was there, my first class, um, I don't even remember what it was called, but they showed hearts of darkness, the movie about the making of apocalypse now. Right. And there was this discussion afterwards and the teacher said uh if if apocalypse now wasn't considered a classic would anyone care about this and the all the film students are like yeah of course we would of course we, we would watch it as a cautionary tale blah, blah blah and i said i raised my hand which i shouldn't have done and i said i you know i kind of beg to differ nobody wants to know about why Bonfire of the Vanities failed, even though there's a great book about why Bonfire of the Vanities failed called The Devil's Candy. Um, but there's no documentary about it. Although they, actually they might be turning it into a documentary now that I mentioned, but this was 20 years ago. Um, and for the rest of my tenure at Columbia College, that the students in that class called me De Palma because I was just this De Palma worshiper because I dared invoke the name of Bonfire of the Vanities. Oh, my ex went to Columbia also. Well, it's a... He was in the sound engineering program, though. So. Okay. Hey, like John Travolta. Yeah, yeah there you go. Right <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's... That's that's really shitty. Wow. Uh, I'm you know. That, you know I'm it made me not want to be there. Film students being exclusive, uh, exclusionary? Yeah, like, right. I'm shocked. 
Well, and it's funny because I think now a lot of film students would sort of worship at the altar of Brian De Palma. I think his career has been legitimized by other filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino have talked about what an influence he is. But in the mid 90s, Brian De Palma wasn't someone that you looked up to if you were a serious film student. You know, Francis Ford Coppola was, yes, Martin Scorsese, sure, but not Brian De Palma. He made schlock. Which I don't understand after you after you make something like The Untouchables. Right. That you're considered a schlock filmmaker. Yeah. Like, what the shit? Well, at this point, Mission Impossible probably wasn't out yet because this was probably like 90, late 95. Okay. Um, his last movie was probably Raising Cain, and before that was Bonfire of the Vanities. So he was kind of on the okay. outs. Which Raising Cain is really freaking good. It's really fun, yeah. And I didn't even realize John Lithgow was in Blowout until like he pops in, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Yeah, it all makes sense. Yeah. So, and Dennis Franz, who shows up in a lot of uh, De Palma movies, always playing yeah. a scumbag. Shocking. <laughs> in like a tank top, I'm, he's I always am appalled. Sipowitz. <laughs> he's always in like a seedy <laughs> hotel room. Always a scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually where he just lived back then. <laughs> they, in, in, he didn't even know they were making a movie. He just no, he was just like Nancy Holmes, come to hang out, right? <laughs> hey, Nancy. <laughs> I, I don't do a good Dennis Franz, but I was trying to do my Chicago accent. I don't. Yeah, I've tried. I've tried I was trying to. I, I keep going into y'all, so I keep getting more of my West Virginian, uh, yes, Virginia, no. Virginia type t- speak. So I'm, I'm slowly slipping away from Chicago. <laughs> so. Hey, Nancy. Yeah, I don't really have one either. No, no. All right. Uh, Let's get Dennis Franz on the show so he can. Oh, man. Do you think he'd do it? I do. Do you think we'd get him to show his butt? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I've never seen one. I remember it being a thing, but I've never seen a single episode of NYPD Blue. Oh, I used to love NYPD Blue. Oh, my God. When Jimmy Smith's character died, like, holy shit. That was like. Spoilers. Yeah. Well, like you had 40 or something years or whatever (laughs) to catch up with it. It was like that was like the equivalent of like Buffy having to kill Angel on Buffy. Oh, my God. It was just like it was Niagara Falls, Frankie. Uh, It was something. (laughs) I didn't watch. uh, I didn't watch Buffy when it aired. But I did watch it as soon as they started putting out the DVD sets. So I think by the time season two came out on DVD, season six was airing on TV. But they used to put them out like a year apart. You'd have to wait a year. So it was just like watching it on TV because I watched all of season two. Erica and I watched all of season two, got to the end. She kills Angel. And we're like, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? We won't know for another year until they put out season three on DVD. Like people that have an entire series streaming at their fingertips have no idea how good they have it. They they do not. Yeah. I, I remember uh, when season two finished, it was I think that was like 98, I want to say. And that was basically when my mom threw me out. Oh, geez. Yeah. And so I remember watching the season finale of Buffy because basically she leaves Sunnydale. Yeah, right. Like she kills Angel and she goes off on her own and I'm literally sitting in my very first apartment which was in the basement of this house in Forest Park and laying on this like hand-me-down couch that I got from my ex's parents which was like a wood-framed couch. It was the most uncomfortable thing and I was just sobbing because like she's killed her boyfriend. She's out on her own now. Everything is terrible and I just remember thinking like, oh my god, I'm like, you know, 19 years old. I'm on my own. What is happening right now? So, yeah, yeah I, that 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 season hit me really hard. And then, of course, the the body episode. I don't know if I can ever watch it again because that was rough. That was a good one. The one that sent me sobbing was the end of season five when she sacrifices herself to kill oh. Glory. Yes. Uh, for whatever reason that like I had like, like a nervous breakdown that night and I was just, like inconsolable. Oh, yeah. How good is Buffy? Sorry. I think we're turning this into a Buffy episode. Which so is, Buffy has know. been canceled. I'm sorry. Joss Whedon canceled. Buffy canceled. Uh, well, we canceled the original Buffy. We haven't canceled new Buffy. No, none of the cast has really been canceled. Just the creator. Yeah. Although 
uh, what's his face isn't exactly Nicholas Brendan hasn't had a, a good run over the last few years. Oh, I haven't heard much about him. What am I what am I missing? Um, I believe some uh, assault and battery. Oh, boy. Um, against women. Oh, come um, on. Possibly some disorderly conduct uh, while being drunk, I think, is something else that happened. So, yeah, I mean, the reality is, is we're all going to live long enough to see everybody that we know and love become problematic in some way, shape or form. So I've just decided there are no heroes left in this world, except for you, Patrick. Thank you. That's <laughs> really and all a, I wanted a, to hear. Uh, and a stalwart uh, sound designer uh, by the name of Jack Terry. Yeah, Jack Terry. OK, so this is also my favorite. And, and it's it helps that it's inside one of my favorite movies. But this is also my favorite John Travolta performance. Um, it's, it's kind of really up there for me now, too. It makes me so sad because like, obviously there are several to choose from because you've got he's so great in Pulp Fiction. He's so great in Saturday Night Fever. He's so great in uh, bleh, 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 Get Shorty. Be cool. Oh, yeah. Get Shorty. Not, Not be, be cool. cool. No, um, be, be I've never cool seen, with the Rocks movie. <laughs> I've never seen Urban Cowboy. Uh, I hear he's very good in that. Just kind of coasting on movie star charm. I mean, he's great in Look Who's Talking like. Yeah, he's, he's, he's I mean, you know such a movie star and he's so great in Blowout. And I watch his movies now and I'm like, oh, it kind of makes me sad because he's missing that movie star spark. And I'll, and I'll tell you what, I, I might lose a little horror cred, but like um, despite the fact we didn't even talk about Broken Arrow, uh, which he's really good in or Civil Action, which is also really good. Like, I haven't seen a Civil control. Action in a long time, but someone just recently told me I needed to revisit it because I don't think I've seen it since the theater. Oh, but I'll tell you what, my, one of my favorite Travolta roles is Hairspray. I love him. Sure. Yeah, no, he's sweet in that movie. Yeah, I just I really think that like, there's something adorable about it. His accent's all over the place. Yeah. whatever. <laughs> but is. like he's just clearly having a really fantastic time. Yeah. And it, it was just nice to see him go back to like his musical roots in that movie. Sure. Like, I love Hairspray. Hairspray is like one of my happy place movies. So it just, you know. I like the, I, I've I've only seen the musical once or twice. Um, the original John Waters movie is like one of Erica's favorite movies. So we just rewatched it recently. Um, but I really liked the musical when it came out. And I remember thinking Travolta was very cute in it. Yeah, I, 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 I love the John Waters movie. I actually got to see it. Uh, the musical live a few times in Chicago and Bruce oh, that's Blanche cool. oh, played okay. Edna. So sure. that was pretty fun. And yeah. there was some fun Bush uh, political jokes that he threw in there. Oh, um, Valanche, you topical oh, motherfucker. Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> There's our one F-bomb for the episode. Whoop, whoop. Sorry, everybody. Um, oh, boy. And um, so, like, I've I've always loved Hairspray, like, ever since I was, like, a kid. Yeah. Um, so I've, I love every iteration of it. I was I actually think, didn't think the, the live TV version of it was pretty solid, especially because they had to do some really ambitious stuff. Who was Edna uh, in it, that? Oh, my gosh. Who was? Oh, it wasn't uh, Hairspray Live. Hold on a second. I'm looking it up right now because it's going to torture me forever. Oh, it was Harvey Fire, Firestein. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, sure. Um, but they had, like Kristen Chenoweth was Velma, which was like perfect. And Ariana Grande was Penny. So and then Jennifer Hudson played uh, Motormouth Mabel and stuff like that. So it was fun. Wow. I mean, Derek Hugh is no real Corny Collins. Let's be honest. I didn't um, realize it was so star studded. Yeah, it was actually really good. It was yeah. one of the very few of those live musical things that were going around for a few years. It was actually good. Was this Don't before uh, Ariana Grande was like a big pop star? Was this when she was still like a Disney? No, she, no, she was, she was very much a pop star. Oh, all right. I don't know anything. Yeah. She was like a pop star when she did scream Queens, your favorite show ever. I don't remember her being on scream Queens. What season yeah, was she, she was on? In the f first season. She dies like in the first like two episodes or something oh, like that. All right. so. Well, that's, I don't yeah, think I knew like who she was at that ones. point. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. But she was one of the uh, the, the sorority sisters to the Chanel's. She Did, might have been Chanel number four. I think. Uh, anything you say might be true. And I'll say, OK, um, 
did they ever release that show like on DVD? Can you get a fix for of that show if you need it? Um, I mean, I think it's still on Netflix, but I don't know that it ever got a proper home release. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. So that's all right. I'll live. So now that we got totally off tangent again, look at <laughs> us. We're such old people who can't stay on task. <sighs> Come out, come over here, kids. We're going to tell you some stories. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, because one, I, the thing that I just astounds me that I've never seen this is because I love movies about the movie making process. And yeah. sound is one of those aspects of movies that is so often overlooked and is such a crucial thing. And that's the one thing I always tell, like, like indie filmmakers, like who are making shorts and stuff. Like, I don't care, you know, necessarily like how successful other aspects of it because I can always forgive certain things. If your effects aren't perfect, if your performances aren't perfect, but for the love of God, make sure your sound is good because nothing takes me out of anything quicker than me having to like strain to hear things yeah. or like you hear people's microphones like rustling against their shirts <laughs> or something. Um, and it is such an o overlooked aspect of filmmaking. And I, what I loved about this was like, I just, as soon as it was done, I was like, Ooh, I really want to go watch Barbarian Sound Studio now um, because it would make such a great double feature. I still have never um, seen it with it. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, we need to stop this right now. You should go watch it. All right. Um, well, I mean, what if like we just kept recording and you just waited? OK, that that works well. I mean, it's Toby Jones doing the sound for a Jalo movie. Um, I'm looking it up I, right now to see. I, I, how don't, I, can... I don't know what else you need to Peter Strickland directed. I can rent it. It looks like. Okay. Is in fabric worth seeing? It's. Yeah. I mean, mm, there's parts I of that movie am not that sold. <laughs> <laughs> there's parts of that movie that I like better than other parts. Okay. Um, but it's it's really an interesting exercise in how far you can sort of push inanimate killer objects in horror, um, because some of it's very serious. Some of it's very comedy driven. So if you're not ready for those shifts, um, I think there's parts of it you probably would really dig. Okay. I, I would confidently say there's about 70 percent of that movie that you would really enjoy. All right. Well, 70 percent is yeah. better than I don't know. 60 percent it is that's that's how math works yeah 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 i, I was I gonna say stuff. more than 69 percent. so because then you know i get to joke about that anyway <laughs> um but yeah i i just thought it was really a, a, an incredible um way to sort of showcase sound because also then the movie itself the sound is so immersive and the one scene that really struck me when i was watching it was the hospital scene like after the crash and like you yeah. have ja Jack in there and it's just like everything is like all these little like overlays of conversations and, and chaos and everything is just popping. And you kind of, you know, as he's walking around and moving, it's like it's it's pulling the different focus and kind of giving you these little nuggets to help fill you in. I was just like, I don't I was blown away, if you will. No, by it. nicely um, done. But I was just like. On a technical level, this movie is freaking phenomenal. It really is. I mean, between the, the sound design and all of the photography that's like show off -y, but I would say it's it's the least show off -y of all of his show off -y movies. <laughs> like, he tends to be real show off -y with his camera always. But I would say this is more restrained or when he is doing like these split diopter shots or that sequence that just spins around the editing room over and over again as Travolta comes in and out of the room searching for something. Um, it's always like to a point. It's always for a purpose. It's not just, hey, look what I can do with a camera, uh, which sometimes he does in other movies. And I don't mind because I love it. But So I'm not, I don't even mean it as a criticism, but um, I know that that's some people's issue with him. I listened to another podcast called blank check and they just started doing, uh, they do like filmography series. So they'll cover a, a director's entire filmography over the course of however many episodes it takes. And they just started doing a series on John Carpenter and they're only up to assault on precinct 13, but mm. through the 
course of one of the two Carpenter episodes they've done so far, they talked about Carpenter throwing shade at lots of other directors, including Brian De Palma and saying like, De Palma is just a Hitchcock ripoff. He just shows off with his camera. I'm not into that. And I don't remember exactly where the interview comes from or when he said these comments, you know, it doesn't surprise me that he said these things, but I don't know when he said what point in his career he said them. I believe it was like in the late 70s, but um, I had that in my head as blowout opens because what we have is De Palma sort of riffing on the slasher POV that Carpenter invented with Halloween. Yes. Uh, and I don't think he's doing it as a way of getting back at Carpenter. I'm sure he doesn't even have Carpenter in his brain as he's putting that together, because at, by that point, there were enough Halloween ripoffs and enough generic slasher movies that that's actually what he's commenting on. He's not making fun of Halloween uh, because, you know, game recognized game. Uh, and I, surely I De Palma agree. is a Halloween fan. Yeah, it was interesting when it started because, again, I hadn't seen it, so I wasn't sure what the heck was going on. I was right. like, wow, there's there a lot happening in this dorm place. I was like, Jesus. And it's I was a like, very busy, watching... very horny dorm. Yeah, I was like, nobody has clothes on. It's no. like, wow. No, it's a Brian De Palma like... movie. <laughs> I was like, this isn't how my dorm life was whatsoever for the year I lived in a dorm. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was just like, well, it, but it, I like that because I like the fact that it really, it, 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 it ultimately almost like, kind of it's almost dizzying in a way where it, it just kind of like it catches you completely off guard and from it, and from that moment like you're he's got your attention because you don't know what's going on the camera's moving all over the place there's something going on in like every single like piece of that frame like yeah. you just you can't take your eyes away and ultimately it's not even really the movie that you're there to watch right it's some, you know, low budget slasher called Co-Ed Frenzy, which how great were all the posters in the office? Many of which were real movies, but they one were. of which was for, and I don't remember the exact title, but it, it was like <sighs> Enter the Triangle or something. And it's like, yes, it's like ladies, uh, bikini bottoms with a pirate <laughs> ship going so, down into them. It, so it could have been real. You never know. It probably You're right. was a it may poster very that well, just never happened. It may very well be real. But yeah, that one like cracked me up. Yeah, there's a lot of Canadian stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was fun for also for us because um, they had the Boogeyman in there, which was an Uli Lavo movie. Oh, yeah. Um, and w that was one of the first people Brian actually worked with when he moved out to L.A. No kidding. Was Uli. Oh, yeah. And it was funny because I told you how we watched Possession afterwards. And Heinrich in Possession was very much how Uli was in real life. Oh, OK. Like he was like that crazy eccentric European guy. He OK. Was, like touchy feely shirts buttoned down to his like, navel, sometimes leather pants, like very eccentric, very, you know, had that way about him. So like me. Um, yeah, basically it was like Patrick in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> So it was just interesting because like the we saw the Boogeyman poster and I was like, oh, it's Uli's movie. Mm -hmm. And then we see like, you know, pseudo Uli in, in possession. And it was just interesting because he passed away, I think, last year. So um, I, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but right. yeah, because I noticed like Squirm was on one of the, the posters yeah. and Food of the Gods, um, Empire Food of the, of the Ants. Gods. Yeah, lots of lots of Canadian stuff, yeah. uh, which I remember because of talking to Tom Berman, um, who worked on a bunch of those movies back in the day. All right. Yes. Sometimes I actually remember the things that I write about. Sometimes, not always. <laughs> so, but yeah, I just thought that was kind of fun. Like, I love when we sort of lift the veil a little bit into the world of filmmaking. And it's not even prestigious filmmaking. It's low budget, right. schlocky, you know, sea level horror. Well, there's that great know? joke where he said, how long we've been working together, Jack? And Jack lifts off, lists off five movies and then comes to the conclusion that they've worked together for two years. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty much par for the course back then and how movies right, were getting made. Right. And even Travolta so. can't believe it when he says it. He, oh, my God, five movies in two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, to me, it was just like that. I, as soon as like all of that started to settle in, I was like, holy crap. Like, I don't know what's going to happen next. But I'm in love with this movie. Yeah. Um, and I remember I've seen like, you know, bits of it, like, you know, Tarantino the Isles. I think there's like two really quick snippets of it that pop up in there. Um, Does it use like a Lithgow murder? 
No, because I didn't even realize, like, I saw Lithgow's name in the credits. Right. But I right, didn't right. realize, like, who he was going to be in it. Okay. I, I, and it was funny. As soon as I saw Dennis Franz, I was like, uh, not Dennis Farina, which is what I kept happening <laughs> to me during Dress to Kill. Um, I was, like, immediately, like, well, he's probably going to be, like, some kind of, like, dirtbag. And sure enough, he was a total dirtbag. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, so I really didn't know, like, who Lithgow was going to end up being. Um, so just to see him, you know, playing this, like, really twisted sort of gun for hire who kind of goes off and starts doing his own, has his own agenda um, was very interesting to me. And how many women in Philadelphia look like Nancy Allen? Quite a few, which is why I have built a time machine to travel back to 1980 Philadelphia. <laughs> I do not blame you. <laughs> <laughs> She's so great in this movie, too. And she was cast sort of at the urging of John Travolta. De Palma was reportedly not totally in favor of it because they were married at the time and he didn't want it to seem like he just kept casting his wife because thank God there was no internet. Uh, oh yeah. Right. God, God forbid you cast your wife in movies. Oh um, geez. Don't let, don't let the internet know. No, no. Uh, and, but Travolta pushed for it cause they had worked together in Carrie and thank God he did because she is so delightful and so heartbreaking in this movie. I, and I have to tell you, because, again, I didn't know where things were going. Like, you know, and spoiler, I mean, like, the movie's 40 years old, everybody. Yeah, yeah. So if you haven't seen it, please stop the episode, go watch it, and then come back. But, like, when she dies at the end, I wasn't expecting that. No. Like, I was expecting Travolta to be able to come in yeah. and save her. I thought she would just be sleeping. And then I was like, wait, what? And that made me really sad. Yeah. I was really bummed out because, like, you know, you could tell she was a girl who just, you know, was trying to make her way, wanted something better out of life, but kept kind of crossing paths with the wrong people and going about it the wrong way. And, you know, and ended up paying the price for that. And that right. made me really, really sad. But I loved her in this. It's uh, it's such a tragedy because even Travolta, part of this obsession comes from his backstory, which is that, you know, he was partially I guess responsible for this undercover cop being killed and he feels responsible for that and so he's trying to redeem that mistake by uncovering this conspiracy and putting the the bad people away uh, and once again it gets someone killed rather than him finding that redemption he loses this person that he was you know possibly falling in love with it is it is such a the ending just destroys me. And then the punchline of, like, it's a good scream is so, oh. like, darkly sort of comic, but also so perfect. It's this movie is so goddamn good. <laughs> yeah. When he was, like, just listening to, like, her, like, her little discussion, like, at the end and yes. just sitting there. And yes. I was just like, oh, Jesus. And then it goes to, you know, trying to get the co-ed frenzy scream right. And right. it turns out to be hers. I was like, oh gosh like that is just that was like like poetry yeah i was just yeah it was like one of those movies like and it's funny because like sometimes like i'll show brian stuff and i'm like i don't know if it's gonna hit or miss with him so there's a lot of things where i'm like i know what's in his wheelhouse and what isn't and i was like this one i was kind of like i feel like it'll be okay like we did just to kill together last year he dug that mm -hmm. he's really been into like sort of you know older stuff lately this this could this could work and I've never seen him as giddy about a movie as soon as it was done. Like he was this, like, yeah. you know, like, a, like, you know, just like discovering a classic. Yeah. Like he was just like, oh, my God. Like every time there was a commercial on Pluto, he was like, why do we have commercials? Yeah. Go back to the movie. <laughs> um, and I get it. Like it was just it was so incredibly well done. And I, and I had no idea that there was like this huge sort of like political conspiracy at the center of it. Mm -hmm. Like I just figured it was somebody going around killing women. And uh, so to me, it was like you add in like sort of that political paranoia atmosphere and it just elevates things even more because like, you know, if you're somebody like Jack who, you know, you've already worked with the police and, you know, I mean, we know how we feel about police today, but like back then, you know, police were still like people you're supposed to be able to trust. They had like a commission about like taking away corrupt police officers which made me laugh i was like <laughs> <laughs> good luck um and you know so it's like there was just nowhere for him to turn and 
there's like that desperation and just like throwing the, the, the politics into it. I was just, I was so enraptured by like all of this movie. Like I cannot wait to watch it again. Well, and part of why I love it is that it becomes like De Palma's master's thesis in terms of so much of what he does in movies, um, building to this point and it's like this is the one where he gets it all right and everything's perfectly in balance because he's obviously pulling from real life events because we have like elements of the ted kennedy chappaquiddick crash yeah but he's also always been sort of a politically conspiratorial filmmaker if you go back to his early stuff with de niro I'm thinking of like there's a guy in Greetings who's obsessed with the Zapruder film and like mm. is getting people to reenact the Kennedy assassination and f photographing them. So De Palma's always been a little bit interested slash obsessed with uh, political conspiracies. He's always been voyeuristic, which and I think we talked about this on our Dress to Kill episode, but like. I think he tells the story in the De Palma documentary, which if you haven't seen, you really need to see where he talks about his dad cheating on his mom and he goes out and tries to film his dad to catch him in the act. And so this is where this voyeurism is burned into De Palma at a young age. And so so many of his movies become about the act of voyeurism, well, whether it's the slasher's POV in the opening sequence whether it's Travolta on the bridge recording sound, whether it's Dennis Franz on the bridge taking pictures, we have people watching other people doing things. So we have this voyeuristic element all the time. We have the Hitchcock homage to Rear Window where you know somebody thinks they see something and starts to become obsessed with proving that he's not crazy and proving that it actually happened. Um, we have him referencing Antonioni's blow up. Uh, you know, all the referential stuff works. And I don't know how you feel about the referential stuff. Like, I'm somebody who doesn't really give a shit that he references Hitchcock or Antonioni or whoever he references no. because I feel like it always comes out a Brian De Palma film. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, if you, if you think half of filmmaking isn't referential filmmaking, like, you're not looking close enough because, like... Every movie that I watch these days, I can pull out parts that feel like almost direct references to either the work of other filmmakers or the themes of other movies that, that sort of are. It, it's it's all connected. Like we've been making movies now for 100 years. Yeah. Like it's it's just how it is. So it's like to me, like people who are like, oh, well, you know, this movie's trying too hard to be like a 90s thriller or whatever. You know, I hear that, you know. Things like that, you know, I'm just throwing some weird random thing I've seen on Twitter in the last couple weeks. Like, well, yeah, like, why not? Everything else, you know what I mean? Like, you're good. There's good. It, everything. There's always a blueprint for something out there. Like, unless you're making Nosferatu in 1922. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, you, when you're making Psycho, you know, even though Hitchcock was paving the way, like, there, he's not just pulling from the insular experience of him making that movie in that moment. That movie in that moment is the culmination of Hitchcock's experiences in life and in his career right. up until that point. Like, we talk about those things like they're bad, and I get that some movies do them better than others. But, like, ultimately, like, I don't look at, you know, De Palma's movies and think, like, well, he's obviously ripping off so-and-so. Like, it's just... An uh, accumula accumulation of just the things that he's done in his career, experienced in his life, that movies that he's seen, and that have influenced him to get to where he is in this very moment to make this movie. Well, he's so naked about it that I just, I don't think you can hold it against him. Like, there's no part of him that's trying to hide it. He's obviously paying tribute to, I mean, he calls the movie Blowout and then gives it the same plot as Blow Up. Um, like he's not trying to disguise the fact that it's refer referencing Antonioni. And if he was making bad movies, I guess I could see somebody's point. Like all he's doing is ripping off Hitchcock. Um, but he's making really good movies from my point of view. You know, I understand there's people who don't like De Palma and they might not like his, might not like his movies. And maybe that's the issue that they have with him. I, 
I am certainly guilty of seeing movies that I think are very little more than the sum of a bunch of references. And I think more and more it's becoming a problem in contemporary indie horror, where it's like, look at the movies I've seen, look at how I recreate them. And it's like, yeah, but what else do you have to offer? And for me, De Palma is still offering more. It's not just, I've seen Hitchcock, look what I can do, because it always comes out through his particular prism. And as long as somebody's doing that, you know, even in 2021, if some 25 year old is like uh, making movies that, you know, I think about like um, somebody like Mickey Keating. I'm a Mickey Keating fan. And I think he is very much influenced by other movies. And when he puts out a movie, it's like, yes, I can see what you're paying tribute to, but I also feel like this is still a Mickey Keating movie. This isn't just look at the movies I've seen. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. And also like, you know, the thing is like, you have, you have filmmakers like Tarantino who like, I wouldn't even say he wears his influences on his sleeve like, he literally has a bullhorn and he shouts about them as yeah. he's making the movie. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I mean, and I didn't even realize because, like, of course, like, I was reading up and stuff like that. And Tarantino, there was an article I read about how Tarantino's praised flow out and things like that so much so that he loves this movie that there's a cue from it in, in Death, uh, Proof. Death Proof. Yeah. Which I didn't even connect those dots. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's like, so are we going to get all up, you know, up on Tarant? I mean, everybody already gets up on Tarantino over a lot of things. Yes, we get it. He likes feet. Get over it. Um, <laughs> whoopie do. Um, who doesn't, I mean, you know, right. If there's, if they're good feet, like, you know, go for it, whatever. <laughs> I'm not here to shame anybody for, for what, for their predilections. Right. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I, you know, there's, there's always going to be filmmakers who are going to want to draw from something else because that's that's what you do when you create art you don't create art in a vacuum right and so for anybody that like you know if, if blowout was simply just a remake like if this was like if this was a shot for shot remake of blow up like okay then i get it but it isn't you know, right, and it's, right. you know, it's like we're not having a discussion versus Psycho 1960 and Psycho 98, 99, whatever that came out, you know, uh, 98. So, yeah, I just I don't understand why people get so up in arms over that stuff. I'm like, you know, if I'm a filmmaker, you know, of course, I'm going to do things and, and you know, uh, celebrate things that I love about other movies in the work that I'm doing. I mean, I make re like. How many times do we go off into tangents when we're just talking on a podcast about other things that we love that <laughs> happen to pop up? Like, it's, it's who we are as a society. Like, right. that's just who we are. Like, we're all referential in a way. Like, we're all going to pull from these things that we love because that's what that's what great art does. It makes you fall in love with it. It makes you want to find those connections, you know. And it, want, it makes you, if you're somebody who is creative, you're going to want to use those connections in the things you create, um, and, you know, for me, like, I love that, you know, De Palma's, you know, love for film is so fully on display here. You know, that to me, like, I would rather watch 100 movies that do that than, you know, one movie that just, you know, basically is like I'm and I, I there's there's a few movies that I've seen over the last few years where I feel like this, where they feel like they're almost better than the medium that they're working in. OK. You know, I, I that to me like is a big turnoff when somebody feels like they're too good for what they're doing or somebody who thinks they're above the genre also is another thing that bugs me. Um, you know, so How can give me a you, million blowouts. I, I would take a million blowouts. How can you tell um, when you feel like somebody is above what they're doing or above the genre? I'm just wondering. OK, so. I'm probably going to get a lot of shit for this, whatever. That's Nobody fine. listens. Okay. It's fine. Okay, good. Oh, but it's a safe space. It's just you and I talking. <laughs> it's Nobody's just gonna hear us. This. Okay, so years and years ago, um, I was at South by Southwest. And I know a lot of people really love this movie, and I cannot stand it. Um, <laughs> I, I was at the screening for Detention from Joseph Kahn. Oh, yeah. And I... The, the movie pissed me off, like, so many different ways. But what pissed me off more was the Q&A after, where basically Joseph Kahn, like, was literally putting down 
everything about the horror genre. Well, slashers are stupid. Nobody cares about horror movies. Nobody cares about horror characters. But and like, it was just like, and I have the audio of it on like one of my old phones. This was before I even had an iPhone. So I think it's like on my freaking Blackberry <laughs> from 2011. Um, and everything about that Q&A rubbed me the wrong way. And I was like, so everything that I read about this, that I took away from watching Detention was right. Right. Like you, you think a character like Sidney Prescott is pathetic. You, that wasn't just like a joke. Like that was something you really feel like you feel like characters in slasher movies are just stupid and invalid and they don't matter. Like, okay, cool. I get it. And to me, like, I just, I hated everything about that movie in that moment. And I've tried to go back and watch it. Still can't do it. Um, and I know to some people, they love it and that's cool. I'm, I'm never going to tell you you're wrong. But to me, as soon as I realized he was punching down at the genre, I was out. And then I even interviewed him because I was like, okay, maybe he was just trying to be like snarky guy just to like, you know, win some points with the audience to be cool guy at South by Southwest. No, it was it was all dead on and he really <laughs> meant it. And then the thing that even pissed me off more was like I and I did my, my review and I will admit my review that I did for it was really snarky. Um, it was very unheather because I'm usually pretty even keeled when I go into reviews, but I was guns are blazing. I was pissed. <laughs> I was just going to go off on this. And I remember he specifically called out my review on Twitter, which is fine. I mean, Hey, somebody read it. That's cool. Yeah. Um, but he taught, he basically said that he wouldn't trust. Cause like he was, he was like one of the things he was like shitting all over the saw franchise, which I was just like, Okay, why? Like, obviously, these movies are popular and they're making money and people like them. Like, if they're not your cup of tea, cool, but like, move on. Obviously, they are somebody's cup of tea. But like, so I love the fact that like, when he posted my review and was making fun of it on Twitter, he was like, well, I would never take anybody who actually likes the Saw movies' opinions seriously. Mm. But the best part of all of that is that at that South by Southwest, you know what movie was playing that year? What Insidious. Movie? Oh. And guess who Joseph Kahn was over there trying to be all buddy buddy with? <laughs> James Wan and Lee Winnell. So I'm an idiot for liking the Saw movies. Right. But the guys who made Saw are not. Right. Because they're in a position of power or something. So to me, it was just all backwards. Anyway, that's my detention story, and I will never watch it again. I tried a second time, and I just couldn't do it. Um, but to me, like, I just don't like when people punch down at the genre and try to act like they're above it when they're making a genre movie. Yeah, I can tell when people, you know, in interviews or q and is when it feels like they're above it or they're like, well, I'm not really a fan of horror movies. I remember even what's his name said it when he was doing press for It Follows. Um, yeah, we won't uh, get into It Follows either. <laughs> no, and I know you're not a fan. I don't that much hate mail, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, I know your feelings about It Follows. I, I like It Follows, but I was annoyed when he was like, I don't like horror movies. It's like, all right, cool. Maybe just keep that to yourself. But um, yeah, but I, I don't know that I can tell just by like when I'm watching a movie. I can tell when somebody really loves horror movies and just wants to put all that love up on the screen. And sometimes it works and sometimes it's like, yeah, but that's not enough. You still have to be able to tell a story or like give me a character worth caring about, you know, just loving horror movies isn't quite enough. Um, we, we both watched a movie recently from Fantasia that wasn't a love letter to horror movies, but it was just like, look what I can do on screen. <laughs> I won't name the movie, <laughs> but you know the one I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, and for me, it's like, OK, but is that enough? Is that a movie? You know, I guess it is. But I'm, I'm yeah. off topic. Uh, <laughs> the point is, I don't mind references i don't mind homages as long as what's coming out the other side feels original you know i i can watch a tarantino movie and i know that it's referencing a bunch of other stuff i know that there are shots and costumes and props and music cues uh from other movies that he has seen but it still comes out the other side feeling like a Tarantino movie. And same goes for Edgar Wright and same goes for Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, when I, when I can't get on board with it is when it just is like, 
you're just this collection of empty references with nothing really holding it together. Yeah, you need the connective tissue. Yeah. And that the, the, the connective tissue should be the stuff that's like original to what the, the story is that you're telling. Right. You know, there has to be a balance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love it. Like, you know, I wish... I think for me, nothing makes me happier when I can feel a filmmaker's joy about movies in a movie, the, the, the movie that they're making. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like the last thing I want to feel is like disdain for the process right. while I'm watching a movie right. because it's not going to make me enjoy it anymore. Right. Like if you're not having fun making it, I'm not going to probably have fun watching it. You want the guy making your dinner to love food more than you do. Exactly. That's a really great analogy. You're so smart, Patrick. Thank you so much. <laughs> but I'm thinking about, yeah. you know, Tarantino. Like, n you're never going to love movies more than Tarantino does. So None of us are. We can never, we can never compete. You're in good hands because the guy making the thing you're watching loves this way more than you do. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I wanted to talk about the look because um, I know we're, we're already – getting well into things, but I wanted to talk about, uh, the cinematography in this too, because one, of course we get the, the De Palma twirls, which I just love, although they're really disconcerting, uh, during the sequence when Jack is in his office and he's realized that all of his tapes have been erased. And yeah. I was like, I was like, I had to hold onto my couch for a second. Yeah. Cause I was like, Oh, you boy, keep thinking we're... it's going to stop spinning and it keeps spinning. Yeah. I was like, it's going, it's going. Uh, <laughs> at least he Momos. didn't put Jack, at least he didn't redo a carry and put Jack on a little lazy Susan in the middle of the room and spin him the other direction. Oh, I kind of would have loved that though, to be really <laughs> honest. Um, it would have been really, really like dainty and fancy. Um, but I, I love the fact that how the, the, the way that they're able to sort of capture Philadelphia at night, mm -hmm. there's, it just, it really adds a lot to this. And it really makes like those, those little bursts of color burst even more. Yeah. And I don't know if you know that, like, I don't know about this cause you know, you're sort of the expert here. So like for the, the fireworks sequences, were those like the real actual fireworks or did they have to like superimpose things like into that shot, like it's like at the end when like uh, Jack is holding Sally, like is yeah. that? Like, so I'm I don't, do you, I don't know, do you know? for certain. Okay. It, to me, it looks like a process shot. It does, right? But it, yeah. but I don't really know if they would have had the money to do that back then. Um, I don't know for sure. I know, like, there's a piece of trivia that some of that climax got stolen from a van, and they had to reshoot it. Yeah, I read it. that. Um, and maybe that was something that they reshot. I don't know for sure. Um, I know the reshoots were shot by a different cinematographer because Vilmos Sigmund was unavailable. So they got Laszlo but Kovacs it, to do the reshoots, which, which is I'm like, just like, so you basically went from like <laughs> right, the exactly. ace to like the other ace right. of cinematography at the time. Shoot, this guy's not available. Let's get the other best guy. <laughs> right like how how like crazy is that because like usually you kind of get like maybe the guy who ran second unit right, will run right, in right. and do their right. shots so they're like no no we need laszlo kovacs <laughs> we got his we got your cousin barney zigmund <laughs> yeah, right it's <laughs> almost as good that's that is pretty amazing um i mean it's it's terrible that the they lost the footage but also kind of amazing that yeah. You know, you have somebody like Laszlo come in and be able to, to do those shots, like to be available to do that. Right. Like if you like the dude shot Easy Rider. Yeah. Like, holy crap. Like, that's kind of amazing. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, so Paper I don't know Moon? for oh. sure. I've never seen Paper Moon. I'm a bad cinephile. Oh, you are. Yeah. It's okay. I like, it's funny. A lot of people kind of make fun of Bogdanovich, but I kind of like his stuff. I don't know. I'm like he's just, deficient he's on, my, on my Bogdanovich. That was another one that Carpenter made fun of <laughs> was Peter Bogdanovich. By the way, can we talk about his random cameo in It Chapter 2? I think I was the only person that when I was in my screening understood who that was. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. And everybody's like, what? Remind me who he played. <laughs> He plays the director at the beginning. Oh, yes, um, I absolutely remember that. Okay. Yeah, who's the, the working on the movie with, right. um, what's his face from They're Split? The James McAvoy. McAvoy's, they're making a movie yeah. of his book, and, and he comes in down the on the little crane yeah. thing, yeah. and he's like, get, get to work or whatever. Yeah. 
Why so. is it chapter two such a mess? You know, I watched it again. Um, a I still love ago. it for the record, but it is a mess. It is. Um, boy, and I'll tell you what, when you watch one and two back to back, it is <laughs> yeah, such a jarring that. experience. I have I'm afraid to do it. It is a really, really jarring experience. But I will say I like it. I liked it a lot when it came out in theaters. I think I like it a little bit more now because I think because I've had be able to sort of like let the dust settle a little bit on yeah. it. And I don't have my expectations hanging over me anymore. Um, but heaven forbid you put uh, uh, call me angel in the morning in your song, in your movie, because everybody <laughs> will focus on that for like the rest of your life. Um, it is a little weird. Yeah, I mean, it is, but I, it's whatever. It's fine. Um, you know, it doesn't bother me. I don't it know. It doesn't bother I, me I, either. I like weird. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, you know, let, let let Andy Machete just do his, get his freak on, whatever. I don't care. You know, as long as we're getting, you know, good good Pennywise stuff, I don't give a crap. Right. Like, um, by the way, just so you know, Laszlo Kovacs actually did work with your boy, Dwight H. Little. <gasps> DHL. Yes, I just, I have his page open and he worked with him on Free Willy 2. Free Willy 2, the voyage home, the journey home. The adventure the, home. The adventure yeah. home. There we go. The voyage home of Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen a Free Willy movie. Oh, yeah. Um, Brian's mom made him try out for the first one. I remember you telling me that. He's walking through the room right now, so I might get, like, something thrown <laughs> at me. So, just kidding. Probably not. He's he's making dinner right now because he's the best. Um, but, yeah, I actually forgot that Laszlo also did Ghostbusters, too, which is crazy. So, yeah. the dude the dude can uh, shoot shoot some movies, that's for sure. Um yeah, I know we just totally got off track again uh, with right. Bogdanovich. Um, I think that's why I love Mask as much as I do, even though I know him and Cher fought through most of that production. But there's just something really special about that movie to me. I don't know. I just like I watched it so much as a kid. So I have avoided it. I mean, I've seen it, but like I've avoided it for years just because I remember it being so sad that I don't want to revisit it. Yeah, it's sad, but it's like I think now, like as an adult, like I just I find the the moments of the good, like the celebration in it. I mean, yeah, it's it's tragic because yeah. you know the poor kid passed away and stuff. Um, but you know he got to share his story with the world in some way. Yeah. So you know, and it's so freaking good. Like, because uh, I have the D the DVD version that has like the extra scenes in it and stuff. So there's like. Um, there's like an uh, additional performance where Cher and Eric Stoltz are doing a musical number, which isn't in the original cut. Oh, wow. Um, and they also swap out all the Bob Seger stuff for Springsteen. Finally. Interesting. Yeah. So because that was what Bogdanovich wanted to do, because the real Rocky Dennis loved Bruce Springsteen and okay. the studio wouldn't pay for it. So they did all Bob Seger. And that's why the theatrical version has Bob Seger. Wow. Songs. And I love Bob Seger. I grew up listening to Bob Seger because I'm off. Sure. Mom, so. Listen, yeah. nothing wrong with Bob Seger. So, but yeah, there's like a little extra. And I and I just, uh, I think there's a little extra with like Lawrence Monison's character in there too. Like his, the scene when they kind of have a fight is a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, that movie is like, it has so many great actors in it. Like, you know, Teddy from Friday four and it has Kelly Joe Minter in it. And of course the mustache Eternals, you know, Sam Elliott. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a good one. I really love it. And Richard Dysart and Estelle Getty. It's just, yeah, we watched it a lot when I was little. So I've just, I always, I, I watch it like once every summer. I don't know for me, it just feels like a summer movie. Cause part of it takes place at a camp with Laura Dern, who I was convinced as a kid was blind. Sure. She's then, that good. Like, and then I honestly, I don't think I really saw her anything until Jurassic park. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was so convinced. That's how good she is. She's a so. talented lady. She is. There's nothing Laura Dern can't do. So now that we've gone off into a Bogdanovich uh, segue. <laughs> is there anything else about Blowout that you wanted to talk about? Um, well, we didn't really talk about the score that much. Pino Donaggio, uh, baby. Yeah, like... He's he's quickly becoming like one of these people that like I've seen stuff in his career. Like I've seen movies like with his music in it. And I'm like, as I'm getting older, I'm just realizing like the guy was a genius. 
He was good, yeah. And I, I, I mostly know his work from De Palma. Like, that's who I associate him with most clearly. Um, if you told me, like, what is Pino Donaggio scored, I could tell you probably five Brian De Palma movies and then nothing else. Really? Uh, not but The I, Howling? I forget that he did The Howling, see? That's to me. That was the one as a kid, like that. I only ever really knew him from right. was, was the Howling. Yeah. So for me, it's like discovering this whole new world of of music out there. Yeah, his De Palma stuff is really, really terrific. Yeah, I was uh, I was very, very impressed. Have they ever released that on vinyl or anything? Um, not that I know of, but huh. they seem to be releasing everything on vinyl now. So. So basically, like we did with Deadly Friend on Craven Craven, yes. in like a week or two, they're going to announce this, the 40th anniversary soundtrack. We got uh, the soundtrack to Jason Lives put out on vinyl also. We we did it. We're doing it, Patrick. We're, we're making the world a better place for horror. Deadly fans. Friend. What else should be like a... Uh, what else should we... Should we get released? They did put know. it out on vinyl, but like in 1982. So, oh well, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're, so we're overdue for a re-release. Yes, and a remastering. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to figure out what we need to use our powers for next. Yeah, figure out what our next cause should be. Because, uh, and and also, I think we need to start working on how we get involved with these things too. Right. Because it's cool to yeah, really. you know, experience it from the outside, but I kind of want to be on the inside of some of these things, well, too. Well, it's a little frustrating when they put out a Deadly Friend Blu-ray and there's no Craven Craven commentary track. Like, I mean, it's it's a no-brainer. Right. It's what BB would have wanted. <laughs> BB. BB. <laughs> um, but yeah, I... I, I don't even know what to say other than I absolutely love this. I I'm love... so glad. That makes me so happy. I was so excited to see a villain John Lithgow because um, I love when he does like the heartwarming stuff. Um, and I like when he sort of the character in between, like something like, um, you know, the his character in Footloose where, you know, he's sort of the antagonist, but ultimately he's not the bad guy. He's right. Just, right. You know, just misguided. See, and yeah. yeah. And so to see him totally being like this really weird, eccentric, cold and calculating <laughs> Kind of guy. He almost, you know what it gave me, you know, it made me feel like Kiefer Sutherland sort of based his character in Phone Booth on Lithgow. In Interesting. Blowout. Okay. I could make, I would make that kind of a, uh, a <laughs> connection. So. I think I read once that Lithgow based his performance on G. Gordon Liddy from the Nixon administration. Mm, I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I like the fact that you like at this time, like you have all the, these filmmakers who were li who lived through a lot of these really big political scandals. And you're seeing a lot of that sort of parlay into their work, especially right. in the late 70s and early 80s. Right. Because, you know, the 80s always get sort of blamed for like fluff, mindless entertainment, which I don't agree with whatsoever, because um, there's a lot of there's a lot of political and sociopolitical undertones if you're really looking for them. Um, and it's not because they're trying to be woke. It's just because <laughs> they were, these were filmmakers who were coming up with, you know, the, the 50s, 60s and 70s and had some stuff to say about it. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I loved it. I, it made me, I, I wish we'd had like 10 movies with John Travolta and Nancy Allen. Yeah. No, they're great so, together. Yeah. Like they, to me, honestly, every time I go back and rewatch Carrie, like I just kind of, I love their stupid car scenes yes. and them bickering and being like a total bunch of assholes. Yeah. Like I just love them so much in that. And they're just so different here. And there's just so, such a, almost in a movie that's kind of skeezy and scummy in a lot of ways, there's something almost wholesome about their relationship. And it's such a fun juxtaposition against everything else happening. And I just absolutely love that. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you loved it. I'm so excited that you plan to watch it again. I I will. Uh, by the way, so do you think like the name Carp, like Manny Carp, do you think that meant like he'd eventually sleep with the fishes? I assume so. Okay. Yeah. All right. That was my other joke I was making last night too. So because uh, I'm really funny, I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> I did know that. <laughs> if I didn't, so, I do now. You do now. If there was ever any doubt, there I you go. I heard that Carp bit, and I'm sold. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, well, thank you guys very much for listening. Make sure you're visiting DailyDead.com every day for more Class of 1981 coverage. It's going to be great. And uh, thank you on behalf of my horror BFF. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks to Brian, our engineer. Until next time, everybody, stay scary. Thank you.